Another place, like Mackinac, that we haven't been able to go for two years, is Bay Mills, Michigan, and a lovely museum lighthouse there at Iroquois Point. Well, this song will tell you how, in 1662, Point Iroquois got its name. Way back in a time when a Manitou sign was the word that showed the way. Just north of the Sioux, 1662, the Salt Ojibwe. Fell on the ran of me with such ferocity that the foes they never foresaw. That the place of their bones would forever be known by the name Point Iroquois. Oh, oh, oh. the name Point Iroquois. In those days the Ojibwe's lived in fear of the Iroquois tribe They always came around for a chance to hunt down whoever forgot to hide A woman and a man of the Garden River band took their kids down to the shore When like an eagle's cry those Iroquois swooped down like a cry of war Oh, 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 oh. swooped down with the cry of war oh, oh. Some Ojibwe scouts went looking about for the ones who disappeared. At Sault Ste. Marie on a hill they could see the very sight all had feared. When the scouts returned a war party soon gave chase the very next dawn. When they reached the Sioux they paddled on through for the Iroquois had moved on. Oh, Iroquois had moved on They found them again at the point open as they entered Superior The Ojibwe saw as the Iroquois went further up the south shore The Garden River Band had a medicine man He told them the manna to sign At dawn's first crack they would attack And revenge the terrible crime Revenge the terrible crime oh. Long ago In the homeland of the crane Whoa, ho, ho Iroquois got its name Well, the next morning came with a shower of rain And they pulled down the enemy's tents with clubs and guns the work was done All at the Iroquois expense But when the sun had set There were just two left Who were sent to their kin back home To tell them that they better never come back To the place of the Iroquois bow The place of the Iroquois bow Well the years went by As the eagle eye of the Ojibwe looked all round but day or night, there was no sight of an Iroquois to be found. They were safe outdoors from the cry of war. They were safe inside their homes. And everyone knew just north of the Sioux was the place of the Iroquois Bowl. Oh, the place of the Iroquois Bowl. Oh. Long ago, in the homeland of the Cray. You know, so interestingly with that song, it, uh, it hits kind of close to home, you know, as uh, Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, as, as an Ojibwe, you know, my, my relatives who know that I'm Mohawk, they say, oh yeah, you know, when the Mohawks came up here, we kicked their butts and we sent them back down to Mohawk territory. And you know, when I was living down in Haudenosaunee territory, 
They said, oh, yeah, you're part Ojibwe. Well, we went up north, and we fought against the Ojibwe's and the Algonquians, and, you know, we smoked them, we rocked them, right? So everybody has an interesting way in, in talking about this history. But when I was little growing up, you know, my grandma told me an interesting story. And the story goes is that the Mohawks made their way up, and they got as far as Garden River. And keep in mind, they had been stopping at all of these communities along the way and, you know, really, really wreaking havoc. They were, they were noted for being very fierce in military combat and in war and that sort of thing. And of course, oral history tells us that there are actually people trapped inside of Trap Rock. That's why it's called Trap Rock. And of course, you know, the, the Haudenosaunee were the ones that had, had done that. But of course, what I was told is that um, they had a, a spiritual practitioner, you know, what we would know as uh, they, they might call him a shaman or we would call him a spiritual practitioner or a medicine person, uh, probably somebody who could do a Jisakon ceremony. And of course, they got word over to the Anishinaabe people that were over in Genosha Conning, over in Bay Mills. They told them that the Mohawks were coming. So of course, what the Ojibwe did is they flipped over all their canoes on the beach. Many hid under their canoes. And then, of course, beyond the shoreline in the bush, you know, the Anishinaabe waited. And when the Mohawk canoes hit the beach, they were outnumbered quite significantly. And as the story goes, and of course, there's, you know, nothing pleasant about war, but they, they defeated the, the Mohawks and they cut all of their heads off. And of course, they lined them up on the beach and they left one. They left one alive. And of course, what I was told is they cut his hands off and they told him to go back to your people and never return to this area. And of course, oral history tells us that on that beach, and this is true, if you go there, you can find all of these red stones on this beach. And uh, our elders tell us that that's a reminder of the blood that was actually spilled there in that battle. Now, we'll find out later, you know, Peter in his research says that two were left. And of course, they cut the ears off instead of the hands. And, you know, I, I kind of believe that because it's probably easier to make it home without your ears as opposed to your hands. But what's amazing is that this piece of history, you know, was told to me by my grandmother, um, interestingly enough, who is the great, great granddaughter of Chief Shingwak. And in spite of having gone through a residential school, you know, that history um, still manages to be told in our communities. It's still here, and that's from the 1600s.